G'day, guys and gal. Games Workshop do a pretty good job of filling us in on their own lore. I mean, you'd hope so, it's their job after all. However, they have left some gaps that have spawned a whole bunch of fan theories for our imaginations to moisten up to. Some of these theories are silly, and when I say silly, I mean I want to use a horrendous explicit word to describe them, but I can't because I'm a sellout shill that craves that juicy green icon. Some of these theories, however, are actually quite good, and I'd genuinely love to see them become canon someday. Hence, today I'll present five of the best fan theories out there. Now, while this is obviously subjective, my opinion matters more than yours, so buckle up buckaroo and prepare to absorb some knowledge. Before we get started, I'm a pretty goal-driven guy, hence I generally offer some pretty weird rewards to myself and you guys upon achieving said goals. As I said last month, if I get to 150,000 subscribers by the end of the year, then I'll pay some ganger to do a live-action cosplay hentai piece that will then go on my Patreon for everyone to enjoy for free. So yeah, if you want to see something that should turn out pretty sweet and spicy, or you know, you think that China should stop trying to antagonize everyone, then consider smacking that juicy red button. Today we'll go over 5 of the best fan theories out there for Warhammer 40k. I'll explain what the theory is and why it's cool. I'll then finish up by providing evidence for or against the theory. Let's get into it. First up, we have the origins of the Tyranids. The Tyranids are here to ruin the galaxy's day. They can't be bargained with, and stopping them is getting increasingly more impossible. They can pull high fleets out of their ass left, right, and center, whilst doing some really noticeable damage to the setting. So where do these space bugs of death come from? Well, the prevailing fan theory pretty much rips off the origins of the Flood from Halo. The theory basically states that after being driven out of the galaxy by the Catan and Necrons, the incredibly pissed off old ones poured their knowledge and malice into creating a new race of alien, the Tyranids. They then wished to use the Tyranids to wipe the galaxy clean of all sentient life so they could come back in and start again, this time making sure not to be mean to salty sunburnt sausage people. This theory is backed up by how weaponized the Tyranids appear to be. Everything about them is built for war, and despite the intelligence of the hive mind, the Tyranids have no interest in setting up biofarms throughout the galaxy. They literally just wipe a planet clean and move on. The Tyranids also appearing in the galaxy at this specific time as well is very suspicious. They had 50 million years during the Eldar's dominance of the galaxy to rock up and they just never did. However, now that the galaxy is eating mega dick, they suddenly appear. The old ones have the knowledge and motive to create the Tyranids, so why wouldn't they? The only issue with this theory is that it's said that the Tyranids noticed the Milky Way when the Pharos device, basically a mini Astronomicon, let off a massive how you doing? And the Tyranids Tyranids saw it whilst they were slowly travelling in between galaxies. In saying that though, there are plenty of ways that GW could be like, yeah, the Pharos device alerted them to the Milky Way, but the old one still made them for this purpose, as the Pharos device firing off may have been a signal to say now is the time to come numb on some ass. Or if GW are feeling lazy, they can just straight up retcon it. As I mentioned earlier, this would be more or less a direct ripoff of the Flood from Halo, as the Flood were created by the corrupted DNA of the Precursors, Halo's version of the Old Ones, who came back to get revenge on the galaxy for decimating them. This comparison is why I believe that GW have steered clear of giving the Old Ones credit, even if that was the original plan. Only time will tell. Or maybe it won't, but you know, that's what fan theories are for, eh? The next theory is very heretical, but I have come prepared, hence I've already whipped myself on the back 69 times and performed partial castration on Timmy as an offer to the God Emperor of Mankind, because this next one is about him. The theory of the true origins of the Big E. Now, in my last video, I talked about the current known origins of the Emperor, you know, in that a bunch of magic shamans performed a suicidal fusion dance. This is widely accepted as his canon origins, however that hasn't stopped a number of fans from coming up with wild new theories for the Big E, some of which are not super flattering. GW themselves have fueled the fires of one theory in particular themselves. The idea that the Emperor was created as a super weapon for humanity during the dark age of technology. You know, as a backup plan in case something like, let's say, I don't know, the Age of Strife happened. This theory comes from the book Master of Mankind, when a naughty minister started talking shit about the Emperor to a custodian, and he basically said he doesn't breathe, sleep, or shit. He's not human, he's a weapon from the dark age of technology that is running rampant. Now this theory would explain why the Emperor was so inactive during pretty much all of his life up until the start of the 30th millennium. 
as well as also explain the huge pothole of that human psychers pretty much didn't exist until the 25th millennium. So how would there be enough psychers in 8000 BC, when the Emperor was born, to create the strongest being in the galaxy? Surely by that logic, they could sacrifice 1 million psychers these days and let them conjoin into an Emperor 2.0. So if the Emperor was indeed a bioweapon made by the Dark Age of Technology and unleashed towards the end of the Age of Strife, his origins and actions would make a fair bit more sense. One thing that does hurt this theory a lot, however, is the fact that it has been confirmed that the Emperor fought and beat the Void Dragon during the Medieval Ages, thousands of years before the Dark Age of Technology. I'm sure GW would be happy to retcon that or come up with a complicated reasoning as to how he time traveled to the Medieval Ages to kick the dragon and its scaling nuts, but yeah, there you go for that theory. Another theory about the Emperor I like, and even made a video about that, you know, nobody really seemed to give a fuck about. <laughs> Sad life, is the theory that from day one, the Emperor planned for a galactic civil war to occur. Now, it has been confirmed in canon that Malkador and the Emperor played this 4D future predicting chess game where they mapped out how the civil war would go depending on which Primarchs flipped to each side. But the theory goes a bit deeper than that. Firstly, the Emperor needed to gain extra power and knowledge to create the Primarchs, hence that cheeky little excursion to the gates of Moloch and into the realms of Chaos. Now the Big E claims that he was able to trick and outplay the Chaos Gods into taking their power, but the theory says that instead he had to promise them the souls of half the Primarchs. This manifested via the Emperor allowing the baby Primarchs to be scattered throughout the galaxy, and not just left in the Imperial Palace to be raised by the Emperor. Because of this deal, the Emperor knew he would lose half the the Primarchs no matter what he tried to do, hence he alienated and treated the ones he didn't want like shit, whilst raising up and praising the ones he wanted to keep. For example, letting Angron's friends die, punishing Lorga for being too loyal, kill stealing Morty's father and then humiliating Morty, sending Perturabo into hellish war zones while then praising Rogel Dawn, you know, it goes on. On the flip side, stuff like confiding in Ferris Manus, Corvus and Vulcan, and treating them with respect was his effort to maintain their loyalty. For the most part, this worked, and it seems that the Emperor even believed he could keep more than half loyal, but you know, that was not to be. Fulgrim fell when he wasn't meant to, and the loss of Magnus was really bad for the Emperor and his Webway project. A lot of people say that Horus falling was unexpected for the Emperor. However, in the Emperor's 4D chess game, whoever was anointed as War Master always ended up falling. The Emperor wished for a galactic civil war to cull the unwanted Primarchs, as well as drastically reduce the population of space marines in the galaxy, as they did not fit into a galaxy at peace. The Horus Heresy, however, mostly because of Titsnitch being a sneaky little fuck, came earlier than the Emperor expected, and the dominoes did not fall in the way he had set them up, hence resulting in us being in the current debacle that we find ourselves in. The second last theory on this list is the theory that Omegon and the Alpha Legion are loyalist, somewhat. We know that Alpharius originally joined Chaos because if Chaos won the Horus Heresy, they would consume mankind and burn itself out. Hence Alpharius thought that the defeat of Chaos at the expense of mankind would be what Emperor wanted. Look, I didn't say Alpharius was the smartest Primarch, alright? We also know that Omegan didn't want to go down this path, however, Alpharius commanded more of the Alpha Legion than Omegan did, hence for Omegan to say no would have likely resulted in his death, or maybe just the naughty corner, but he ain't gonna take that chance. So while it's technically not a fan theory that Alpharius was initially loyal, Omegan attempting to use the Alpha Legion to benefit the Imperium is. It's a cool theory and takes a bit of IQ, so listen. The Alpha Legion was shown two futures, one where Chaos achieves a total victory, has a couple hundred years of fun, then burns itself out, as Chaos isn't very good at administrating millions of planets. This future required the Alpha Legion to aid Chaos. The second future was that mankind beat Horus, but doomed itself to 10,000 years or so of slowly decaying as Chaos devoured everything. This future required the Alpha Legion to fight against Horus. While Alpharus chose option 1, Omegon chose option 3. Option 3 was to do nothing at all, or in this case, nullify the effects that Alpharius had on the war. This is why the Alpha Legion antagonized the White Scars when they were supposed to try and turn them to chaos. This is why the Alpha Legion did not deploy much of their firepower during the Siege of Terra. And in more modern times, this is why the Alpha Legion suddenly appear at the Siege of Vrax Guns Blazing, prompting a huge retaliation by the Imperium, a retaliation that Chaos definitely didn't want to happen. The Alpha Legion also never fled to the Eye of Terra, unlike their way more chaosy cousins. They instead hid in some planets 
planets that weren't even very corrupted. Well, if Alpharis is dead and the Megan is a total loyalist, why didn't he just come out with a full legion of loyalist marines? Why does the Alpha Legion still attack the Imperium? I might hear you ask, and to that I say, eat my dick bitch, <clears throat> sorry, how unprofessional of me. The issue was that when the Alpha Legion sided with Horus, they weren't given the rundown on how they were actually still loyalists, but had to be a traitor in pretend. Hence, by the time Alpharis had died, the vast majority of the Alpha Legion were evil. On top of this, if Omegon declared himself loyalist, it would be a lot harder for him to sabotage chaos and the cons would outweigh the pros. Like yay, the Imperium gets Omegon and like 1000 loyalist Alpha Legionnaires, but no one in the Imperium would trust them whatsoever. Or Omegan can maintain control of hundreds of thousands of traitor Alpha Legionnaires and manipulate them into unintentionally helping the Imperium. I cover this in more detail in my Alpha Legion lore video, but this is definitely one of the more fun theories, and one that is pretty close to being confirmed as canon. I would probably say it's the most canon of all the theories on this list due to a lot of evidence to support it, as well as barely anything that explicitly debunks it. And finally, the last theory which I alluded to in my last video, and this theory I am obsessed with. The theory that in Horus' fight against Sanguinius on the Vengeful Spirit, Sanguinius was the true victor of the duel, and the Emperor had to kill Sanguinius afterwards due to Sangi falling to the Black Rage. Hear me out. Sanguinius was a beast, genuinely in his own category as a Primarch. He could see the future, fly, was an expert warrior and an amazing leader. He solo held the Eternity Gate against the full might of Chaos, and this was after killing Kabunda, the greatest of Khorne's bloodthirsters, and it's implied he also took down Angron as well. So yeah, by the time Sanguinius faced Horus, he was definitely a bit sore. But remember, Lehman Russ beat and wounded a powered up Horus in a duel. Lehman also lost to a pre demon Angron. The idea that Sanguinius could take out Horus is not far-fetched, and even fixes the greatest plot hole in Warhammer 40k. That plot hole being why did the Emperor, a cold, ruthless man who knew Horus was pure evil, hesitate when fighting Horus, allowing himself to be mortally wounded and dooming humanity. It makes no sense whatsoever that he would get a random bout of dipshit tit compassion when faced with his bold red-eyed demon Horus, who was pretty much just the meat sack for chaos by that point. So here's what really happened. According to this theory, Sanguinius fights Horus and Horus gets the upper hand. Sanguinius then falls to the Black Rage, triggering it in all of his sons who simultaneously get it. In current canon, this was due to Sanguinius' death, but in the theory, it's due to Sanguinius also getting it. This also makes more sense, as whilst the death of Ferris Manus was felt by his sons, they didn't all get PTSD or metal dicks or anything like that, so why would Sanguinius' death have such a huge impact? With the Black Rage, Sanguinius overpowers and incapacitates Horus. The Emperor walks into the room, but Sanguinius, deep in the Black Rage, is unable to calm himself and attacks the Emperor. The Emperor not wanting to fight Sanguinius and thinking he can save him, doesn't fight back and gets mortally wounded. Knowing that his death at Sanguinius' hands would ruin what is left of the Imperium, the Emperor kills Sanguinius. He then annihilates Horus and his soul so that Horus can never speak of what happened. Rogel picks up the Emperor, and the Emperor tells him the current canon version of the fight between Emperor and Horus. If GW made this theory canon, it would be the biggest holy shit moment of 40k. It would be clever, impactful, and very grimdark, and it wouldn't even require a retcon. It would completely throw out the whole destiny bullshit that Warhammer often finds itself too deeply entrenched in, and it would give us a plot twist for the ages. Now one flaw with this theory is that the Chaos Gods would have seen Sanguinius fall to the rage and then use that against the Imperium. However, that flaw is easily dismissed by let's say the Emperor not allowing the Gods to witness the battle or that the complete death of Horus also wiped out the Chaos Gods recollection of the fight. Either way, I'm excited to see what happens in the last couple Horus Heresy books. Fan theories are awesome, they are exciting and a huge part of an active community. The fact that GW loves to feed the theories is great and a massive props to them. I would say in the next three years, we will know if at least three of these theories is correct or not. So yeah, if they are, then I'm going to sue 40k theories for the right to use their name as my new channel name, because I'll just be that fucking good. And that does us for today, guys. Five of the best Warhammer 40k theories. If you have your own theory you made or have read, then make sure you comment it down below. If you enjoyed the video and want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be, with only $1 per month giving you access to a boatload of Warhammer hentai. 
hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more theoretical content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.